left off talking about we covered Baker's depreciation and then we talked about 179 depreciation, okay? And 179 depreciation, guys, as a reminder, right, is allowing you to accelerate depreciation possibly by up to $500,000 on tangible personal property only, okay? Um, now we're gonna get into bonus depreciation, which is another provision, okay? where Congress, again, allows us to accelerate depreciation. It's called bonus depreciation, guys, but again, they're not awarding you more depreciation than you'd ordinarily be allowed to have. They're just allowing you to pull it forward faster than you would normally be allowed to do. Now, this one is a little bit different than 179, so take note, okay? It applies only to new property, okay? 179 didn't matter if it was new or used property. Bonus is only good on new property, and it's only good for property with a recovery period of 20 years or less, okay? So it's not going to apply to our real properties, okay? It's not going to apply to buildings or, you know, commercial buildings, whatever. Now, so the, recovery is 20 years or less. the recovery period has to be 20 years or less, and it has to be new property. The ordering of these, okay? Because now we have maintenance depreciation, we have 179 depreciation, we have bonus depreciation, and you may avail yourselves of all of these. So the order says you take 179 first, then you take your bonus, then you take your makers last. So we have two things, right? So you can take 179 and bonus in the same thing? Yep. Yeah. And are we going to assume that they're always going to be doing this? If your goal is to maximize your depreciation and you're eligible for 179 and bonus, yeah, you're going to want to take both. You may use up all of your depreciation with 179. You may not. Because uh, again, you get to pick and choose your assets. And you can pick and choose how much of 179 you want to apply to an asset. But yes, potentially you can use both on one asset. So, and again, if the question is, is you want to maximize your depreciation, then you're going to use as much of these as you can. Okay, so going with the first problem, uh, it's problem number 60 in your book, so I guess I'll just read it. Um, we have a corporation and they have taxable income in 2015 of $312,000 before they deducted any 179 expense. Okay guys, so they have already deducted out of here any bonus and any major depreciation. What they have not yet deducted is 179 depreciation. Um, and then they give us a bunch of different assets and they want to know what the maximum total depreciation is that this company may be done during the year. Okay, so here's our company. They have furniture, they have a computer, they have a delivery truck. I put the recovery period up there, but you guys would have to do that, okay? Um, and then they give us the place and service um, There is nothing placed in service in the fourth quarter here. <coughs> So we don't have to worry about a mid-quarter convention. Um, also, guys, again, be on the lookout. Make sure that in this list is not any sort of real property, right? Because we don't want to factor that into our numbers. It's not. This is all tangible personal property, so we're okay here. Um, and then they give us the values of these properties, and they want us to maximize our appreciation. Again, I said we do 179 first, then we hit bonus, then we calculate acres less. So, how much 179 can we take? <coughs> 222. Okay, guys, again, you start by saying you're potentially eligible for an election of $500,000. But if you place in service more than $2 million of tangible personal property, for each dollar you go over $2 million, you have to reduce the $500,000 by the same amount. So we went over by $278. $500 minus $278 is $222. So we have a maximum election of $222,000. And guys, $222,000 is smaller than our taxable income, right? Because this is our second limitation. This determines how much of our election we can actually deduct. 222 is smaller than our 
half of 312, so we can take all 222. So I'm going to apply my $222,000 against my furniture because it has the smallest percentage, right? So then I'm going to come up with a new balance.
election. Okay, that doesn't mean they're gonna get to use it, it just means they elected $50,000. They can do that because they only have assets of $600,000. So for 179, they're saying they're gonna deduct $50,000 off of that used piece of property. We're gonna calculate our balance to be 550. What's our bonus depreciation? We can't, okay? It's used property, so be careful. As soon as you see used property, no bonus depreciation. It is absolutely zero. So our balance, for maker's purposes, stays at 550. Um, if you calculate our half year, or sorry, our half year percentages, times the balance, our maker's depreciation will be $78,595. Okay. Now they made an election, but we don't know if they can actually use that. Um, so what we have to do is we have to take this taxable income that hasn't had any depreciation taken out of it yet. Uh, so we have to take the 150, we have to subtract out our meter's depreciation. That's going to leave us with 71,405. Guys, this is the cap for the $50,000 election, okay? Do you guys follow in line? They can use it here. They can, in fact, take or deduct the entire $50,000 on their tax return because there is enough taxable income after makers to allow them to do so, okay? Are you guys good? Just again, I want you to appreciate the change in wording of this problem if you go through the problems in the book, okay? This is problem 61. Absolutely, they would make the election for 50, but they would only be able to deduct 41,405, and then the remaining $9,000, they would have to hire to next year. Which actually, I think they might change this for the next part of the problem. Um, okay, part B, they changed the wording a little bit. So here, this will answer you all. Um, if Willard elects the maximum amount of 179 for the year, what is the amount of deductible 179 expense they can take? What is their total <coughs> depreciation? Okay, so now, instead of telling us that they're making a $50,000 election, which you can do, you can elect up to $500,000, but if you want to, you can always pick something less. But now they're saying they're gonna make the maximum election. So it's the same asset, um, so I'm just gonna start with the $600,000 and that's gonna be ready to It's the same piece of used furniture though, okay? But now they're telling us that they're going to make the maximum $500,000 election. And again, they can do that because they don't have more than $2 million of tangible personal property being placed in service. So they can elect all $500,000. It just doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to get to use it. Okay? So their balance after the election is $100,000. They still can't take bonus because it's used. So if we're going to makers, we're still working with the same $100,000. This is still going to apply, okay? So their makers is going to be $14,000 into $290, okay? That would be their makers calculation. Now again, they have taxable income here of $150 minus the $14,290 of makers. Them with 135, 710 taxable income after um, after makers. Okay, so of the $500,000 election, they can deduct 135, 710 for 179 plus, of course, the 14,290 that they're going to take to makers. You can always, always, always deduct makers, even if it creates an NOL you can always deduct your maker's depreciation. That's okay. It's only 179 that is limited by this taxable income, okay? And the taxable income you have to look at is taxable income after all deductions, including makers, everything but 179. So here, really guys, you can't calculate makers until you know what your election is, okay? 
So this is truly, in this problem, this is really the way a company would do it. They would make the election based on whatever tangible personal property they placed in service, okay? They would work through the problem, they would calculate their bonus, they would calculate their makers. Then they would look and say, okay, we have taxable income minus makers. This is now our cap, okay? So here their cap for purposes of 179 is this 135,710. This is what they're going to deduct for 179 in addition to the 14,290 of makers. Okay, so they're going to deduct in total $150,000 of depreciation this year. The other, how much is it? Uh, $364,290. So they made an election of 500. They're actually allowed to deduct of that 135,710 for 179. So the other 364,290 is going to be a carry forward for 179 purposes. Okay? This is truly the way it should be done. Okay? The other problems we've been working on, guys, up till now have all been saying before 179, before 179. So they've already subtracted makers, but the fact is, is you really can't calculate makers until you know what your election is. So it's a little bit backwards, but they were doing it just to make their point. This is the right way. So where did the carry forward go from? The carry forward is, right, they made an election for 179 purposes of $500,000. But we said that's just an election, doesn't mean you get to use it. You only get to use this to the extent there's taxable income available to you, okay? Here, they started by telling us that this company had $150,000 of taxable income before any depreciation deductions, okay? That's not our true cap yet. Our true cap is taxable income after all deductions, including makers, everything but 179. So we had to calculate makers, take it out of the 150. This 135, 710, that's our 179 cap because now everything has been taken out of taxable income except for 179. 179 is the only item left on the table. So that's our cap. They're gonna take the 135, 710, because that will bring them down to zero of taxable income. And then you take your $500,000 election minus the 135, 710 you're allowed to use. The other 364, 290, the election that you made that you can't use for 179, you bring forward review to next year. So this year they would have a net operating loss of the makers depreciation, right? There's no operating loss because they had taxable income of 150, okay, before they did anything. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to deduct oh, the 14,290, okay, okay? So now we're at 135,710. That's the cap for 179. They tried to use 500, but they couldn't. They can only use it to the point it brings them to zero. So they would take the remaining 135,710 of taxable income, they would wipe that out with a 179 deduction of the same amount. And then the portion of the election they denied, they move forward. Stand up. Um, so let's say next year you place more assets in service and you have taxable income of 500000 So are you only allowed, like, with the carry forward, are you allowed to make another 500000 Yes. And then and you would try to use forward? this as well. Okay. Yes. You would try to use both. Okay. Good? You got it? Okay, guys, one more of these. If you get that, then you're in good shape. Um, okay, so problem number 62. We have Sivert Corporation. Uh, they have 20 ta uh, 2015 taxable income of 750 before just 179. Okay, they've already taken makers out of this one. And then they give us a bunch of different assets, and they basically want us to once again answer the same question. So there's some property. Okay, a couple of things to take note of, guys, again, on an exam, I would highlight those in red, box them, circle them, star them, whatever, to draw your attention to them. You have a fourth quarter asset, which should concern you. You have a used piece of property, which means you can't use bonus depreciation, okay? Um, so, who do we start with? We want to maximize our depreciation. Where do we want to start? We want to start with 179. We want to take 179. Um, I calculated it for you really we're out the fourth quarter because we do have an asset. These are all tangible personal property. So 
we're going to look at 1440 over 1913 is greater than 40%. So we are on a mid-quarter convention, in fact. Um, and I put our percentages here, but we're going to start with 179. And how much 179 can we take? That's 750, sorry. We're going to take 500. And again, we're not, first we're worried about the election we're going to make. Then we're worried about taxable income as our cap. We're allowed to take 500,000. We have enough room in both. Now guys, take note here. Generally, the rule says that you take the 179 and you put it against the item with the smallest percentage. That was our general rule. Okay, but I'm going to break that rule again. Okay? When you have a used piece of property that isn't eligible for bonus, okay, it's not eligible for bonus, it says take your 179 because it won't get any bonus appreciation and put it there first. Then go to your smallest percentage piece of property. So here, of my 500, I'm gonna use 93 of it against this asset first because this asset won't get bonus depreciation. And my idea is I wanna maximize depreciation. So I'm gonna take 93 against that, and then I'm gonna use my other 407 against the asset with the smallest percentage, okay? So I am in fact taking $500,000. Then I come up with a balance. This is now worth zero, and I have three ten. Okay, now I take my bonus. And again, guys, you're gonna take 50% of properties with recovery periods of 20 years or less. We've already gotten rid of the used property, so we don't have to worry about 50% on that anyway. So.
possibly, like, it's possible I could have probably done the wrong numbers. Let me, let me see, because this does say 15. Or I could probably done the wrong date. Let me look at it and get back to you. But there is something, you're right, something's not okay there. But I know the numbers are right, but I do not. <laughs> so I might copy the date wrong or something. I'll look at that too. Um, all right, guys. That's the deal with this. Are you guys good with this? Okay. 179. Again, look to see how much tangible personal property they place in service. If it's $2 million or more, it reduces your election. Then you're looking to your taxable income after all other deductions to see how much of your election you can use. Bonus applies only to new property recovery period of 20 years or less. And then last, you calculate your makers using the general rules and conventions we've covered. Okay? Um, okay, guys, the book then gets into what is called listed property. So in chapter nine, guys, we discussed um, mixed use expenses. Um, and these were business expenses, guys, that had elements of personal use and elements of business use. And we focused on meals and entertainment, right? And we said they're only deductible up to 50% because there's some aspect of personal in there as well as business. We also said that the IRS heavily scrutinizes travel because again, it may be business, it may be personal. We really have to look at the predominant reasons for the travel. Well, in this case here, there's special rules for depreciation of what are considered mixed use assets. Assets that may have elements of business purposes, but also guys honestly are a lot of times used for personal purposes. So they change the depreciation rules to make sure that no abuse is being um, carried on. So listed property in the code, guys, they specifically list a few items. It's defined as passenger automobiles, okay? Standard passenger automobiles, as well as any other forms of transportation. So a corporation has a private plane. They might have a boat that they use to entertain clients. Um, there's a problem in the book where they have RVs that they use on a farm, okay? Any other form of transportation. Um, there's a general clause that says any property used for entertainment, recreation, or amusement, okay? A company might own a ski house. Again, they might actually use it to entertain clients there, but chances are pretty good that the employees <laughs> of the company are also using it to ski and have fun. Um, they also go on to include in that definition um, any photography sort of equipment, any sort of... Um, video recording equipment, uh, communication equipment, phonographic equipment, anything of that nature. Again, guys, the idea here is that these are things that, yes, we're gonna use in a business, but chances are I'm gonna take them home on the weekend and use them for myself. Uh, and then PCs and any sort of related peripherals, okay? What section of the book are you on? Uh, it's a list called Listed Property. Um, okay, so rules are this, guys. If your business use of the property is more than 50%, the rule just says very strictly, calculate your maker's depreciation like you would, and then you're allowed to depreciate whatever your appropriate business use percentage is. So calculate makers, and if you use it 80% for business, times 80%, okay? The problem comes in when your use of the property drops to 50% or less for business purposes, okay? If you use the property 50% or less for business reasons, then we're no longer using makers. Then we're using what's called this alternative depreciation system, which I mentioned like two classes ago, okay? When you go over to the alternative depreciation system, there is no 200% or 150 allowed. You have to use straight lines, okay? And it generally is gonna slow down the recovery period of the assets. Five-year assets remain five-year assets under the ADS system, okay? But seven-year assets become 10-year assets. So they're slowing it down because now it's predominantly a personal expense. It's not really a business expense. So they're still gonna let you take depreciation, but they're gonna slow it down. You have to use straight line, and it may have an extended recovery period. Five years, five years, seven year becomes 10 year. Now, you may have one of these assets, okay? And you may use it 
70% for business in the first year, 70% in the second year for business. But then in the third year, you may drop to only 40% business use, okay? Not only do you switch to the ADS system in that third year, but the rules say you have to go back to year one and year two as well and recalculate using the alternative appreciation system in those years. And then you make an overall true up in the current year that your use falls below the 50% mark. We'll do a problem so it makes more sense. So you not only switch to ADS in the year you drop below 50, okay, but you actually have to go back to the other years and recalculate and then do a true up. So let's look at problem number 65. Um, we have assume that Ernesto purchased a laptop on July 10th of this year for $3,000. In year one, 80% of his usage was for business and 20% was personal. This was the only asset he placed in service, which is basically telling us guys that we're on a half year convention, okay? Uh, and ignoring uh, 179 and bonus, answer the questions for each of the following. In uh, part A, they wanna know what his depreciation deduction for the computer is in year one. So in year one, we have a new laptop, half-year convention, um, business use is 80%, personal use is 20%. So we're gonna take our $3,000 asset. We're gonna go to our maker's tables. If we go to the half-year table, we go to the five-year column for the five-year recovery asset, to PC, okay? We should have 20% as our number but then we have to further reduce it by 80% business use, okay? So in year one, you should get a $480 depreciation deduction. Again, guys, as long as the business use stays above 50%, it's your normal maker's depreciation calculation times whatever the business use percentage is. So part B says, uh, what would Ernesto's depreciation deduction be in year two, if his uh, year two usage was 75% business, 25% personal, which is what we have here. So it's the same asset. He's still above 50%. So we're still gonna make our normal maker's calculation for year two. Again, we go back to our half year chart for a five year asset, year two. It should be 32%. Times his 75% business usage in year two, you should have a $720 year two, sorry, deduction, appreciation deduction, okay? Part C, what would Ernesto's depreciation deduction for the computer in year two be if his usage was 45% business and 55% for personal? Okay, so now we're recalculating year two because in fact, he only used it at 45% for business. He dropped below 50% and 55% personal. So now we are on this alternative depreciation system in year two. So we have two calculations to make here. The first one is we take our asset and we're going to divide it by two. Am I on the right? Oops, sorry. I'm in the wrong spot. We're going to divide it by five because we're on this straight line now, okay? Drop below 50%, we switched over to the ADS. So we're on straight line. So 3,000 divided by, it's a five year asset, okay? And then divided by two, because I have to recalculate year one, okay? I'm not only doing year two, but I have to go back and recalculate year one. And year one is a half year convention year. So for year one, I should have reported 240. For year two, I'm simply gonna divide by five. Oops, Divided by five, divided by two for the half year convention, sorry, times 80%. With me on year one? We're going back to year one. We're calculating on the ADS system. Straight lines. We have our asset divided by five years for straight line. Divided by two because it's the first year and it's a half year convention. So that's going to give us the convention. 
and then times 80% because that was his business use percentage in year one. So that will give him $240,000 in year one. Okay? For year two, it's the same $3,000 asset, straight line basis, so we're dividing by five, times his 45% business usage. That's 270 for year two. So in total, between the two years on the ADS system, I should have booked $510, okay? But in year one, I already booked 480. Year one's closed, okay? So minus 480 means this year, I'm gonna book $30,000. Okay, I'm doing a catch up here. A true up, I should say. You with me? Why'd you subtract the 40? Because this is now year two, this problem. Year one's already closed. And at the time, this business use percentage was above 50%, and we used the regular maker's depreciation, and we booked on our tax return 480 last year. But this year, this business use percentage dropped below 50%. So we don't only change to the ADS system in year two. We have to recalculate year one as if we were on the ADS system at the time. So we recalculated year one, we recalculated year two. So in total, under the ADS terms for both years, we should have a five hundred and ten thousand dollar depreciation deduction. He booked we booked four eighty last year. That year is closed. So five ten minus four eighty means to get us to the right place this year, we're gonna book thirty thousand dollars more. Oh, depreciation. You just now, how much it should be. now, we're calculating here how much it should be. Okay. Figure out where you are year to date, and then we're doing a true up. Okay. And then in the exam, the question will go be the last one. So we will put uh, 30 in year two, or we'll put two No, you would put 30 in year two. This would be your answer. Because if I asked you what would be your depreciation expense in year two, it would be 30. Because again, you booked 480 last year. So you've already taken 480 of the 510 you should have taken. So in year two, you need to take another 30 to get you to the right spot. Okay? Okay. Uh, part D. What would be Ernesto's depreciation deduction for the computer in year two if his year two usage was now 30% business and 70% for personal? Okay? So it's more or less the same problem but now his business use percentage has dropped even lower, and we're still calculating year two yet again. So here we've got the same 3,000. We're gonna go back and calculate year one on the straight line basis, because his business use percentage is below 50%, so we're gonna divide by five for straight line. We're gonna divide by two for the convention. And in year one, his business percentage usage was 80%, so it's the same 240 in year one that it was in the earlier problem. Okay. Now for year two, 3,000 divided by five for straight line, we're on the ADS system. And his business use percentage this year is 30%, so that's 180 for year two. So in total, for both years, he should have depreciation expense of 420. Last year, he took 480, right? He's already taken 480. So he's taken $60,000 too much depreciation, right? You don't take negative depreciation, guys. In this case, this is reported as gross income. You take no depreciation deduction this year, and you report this $60,000 as gross income. Can you explain again why I have to uh, calculate the first year again? Yes. Why we're calculating the first year again? Because the rule says that, look, you might have been using an asset for more than 50% for the first year, the second year, the third year. Maybe in the fourth year, you all of a sudden drop to below 50% business reasons. And when you drop below in any given year, you change the alternative depreciation system, not just for that year, but you have to retroact it to all the prior years as well. Uh, 
So you get to go back to all the earlier years and put them on the ADS system as well. Okay. You figure out what your ADS calculation should have been for all of the years through this year. Okay. Figure out what you actually booked in those prior years under the maker's calculations. Mm -hmm. And then in this year you do a true up. You're either going to book extra depreciation like we did here, or if you booked too much depreciation in the earlier years, you're going to actually in this year take the difference as gross income and you're going to report zero for depreciation, okay? So year two depreciation will be zero. Year two depreciation will be zero and you would report $60,000 of gross income on its return. Okay. So what happens if on year three it goes back to, let's say, 70%? You can do business use, but you're going to leave this alone. So even if it's like the 18th year of depreciation, you have to go back and change all of them. And the rule says once you fall below, you retroact for all prior years. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're lowering uh, gross income by 60? You're not lowering gross income. You're actually reporting gross income of 60. It is not, I put the brackets there for subtraction purposes, but your year two answer here, your year two tax return in this problem would be $60,000 of gross income is what you report, and you would report zero depreciation for this item. That would be your answer. You have no depreciation, and you have $60,000 of gross income. Okay? Guys, can you note in this problem, here and here, and C and D, okay? We had a computer, is a computer? Yeah, computer, so it's a five year asset. But if this was a seven year asset, okay, a mixed use seven year asset, and all of a sudden in year two or your um, his business use fell below 50%, we wouldn't be dividing by five, you would be dividing by 10, okay? This is a listed piece of property. Once the business use falls below 50%, okay, if it's a five year asset, it stays a five year asset under ADS. But if this started out as a seven year asset, okay, once you fall below the 50% mark, it's, you're not going to divide by 7. You're going to divide by 10. ADS switches 7-year assets to 10-year assets. Okay? Okay, guys. Um, it next flips over into luxury cars. And guys, luxury cars are considered a form of listed property. So all the rules we talked about still apply to luxury automobiles now. So what we just covered here still is going to apply to our automobiles, okay? Um, and the reason these provisions are in place, again, um, you know, under 162, businesses are allowed to deduct their ordinary and necessary business expenses, okay, guys? But, you know, afford, you know, whatever, is going to be considered reasonable in most cases, but the IRS isn't going to allow you to depreciate, you know, a high-end Mercedes or a Porsche or likewise. So they're putting these rules in place to make sure they're not subsidizing, you know, your choice in fancy high-end automobiles. Um, they're only going to allow you to deduct reasonable depreciation. Um, and in 2015, these actually limits haven't changed in a lot of years now. These are the limitations. You are not allowed to deduct more than this in any given year for an auto. Okay. What's important to note, there's a couple of things here, is this includes 179, okay? So you can take depreciation for an automobile in year one, and you're limited by these amounts. The idea is that you're gonna calculate makers, again, assuming you're above 50% business use for this auto, you're gonna calculate your normal makers number, and then you're going to compare it to this luxury auto limitation. And you have to pick the lesser of the two numbers. Okay? Just know that included in this $3,160 is $179 depreciation. So you cannot take extra $179 above that number. What's it saying? It's for the Y4? It's four on. Year four through however long it takes to depreciate. Okay? You are, though, allowed to take $8,000 of bonus depreciation on top of this $3,160 in the year you placed it in service. So $179 is built into this number, but there is, you can take $8,000 of bonus depreciation. Okay. 
So the idea again, guys, is as long as your business use is greater than 50%, calculate your maker's number, see what you come up with, then apply it, compare it to this number. Whichever is lower is the number you have to select. Once you pick from this chart, once you go to the IRS chart, they said this is your lower number, you have to, for every year thereafter, you have to stick with whatever's on this chart. So, you know, if your makers calculates in year one is $3,500 of depreciation, well, you have to, you're limited to 3,160. And don't even bother calculating makers for the year after, because at that point, once you're picking a number from this chart, you're sticking with this chart for the duration of the life of the asset, okay? So once you go to the limitation chart, you're stuck with the limitation chart. Um, other notes built in here. Um, trucks and vans that are 6,000 pounds or less actually have their own limitation table. We are not going to be worried about it, okay? We're just gonna focus on these cars, okay? Auto, auto passenger cars. But know that trucks and vans do have their own separate table. Um, these limitations do not apply to cars for hire, so limousines, taxi cabs, things of that nature, because guys, they may be in the business of providing a high-end automobile, so these limitations won't apply to those types of services, okay? Automobiles that weigh more than 6,000 pounds, okay? These limits do not apply. Because typically those are going to be more of your heavy duty machinery type autos. Okay, they're going to be used in construction, they're going to be used for delivery, things of that nature. And those are truly not things, guys, you're going to be tooting around town in. They're going to be used in business. So these limitations don't apply to autos more than 6,000 pounds. But note, even with those autos, okay, so if it's more than 6,000 pounds, you're going to use regular makers. But they limit you to only $25,000 of 179 expense and $8,000 of bonus depreciation, even for those autos. Okay. But those you said were not responsible for for this cut. I said trucks and vans. <laughs> you said I want to Yeah, the trucks and vans have their own list, but if it's an auto greater than 6,000 pounds, you're not limited by this for depreciation purposes. So go ahead and calculate your makers, whatever it is. But what you are restricted by is that for those cars, they only get $25,000 of 179 and $8,000 for bonus depreciation. Max. So 
So you're going to calculate your makers. It's always your first step, is just calculate your makers and see where you come out. So my makers for the two years would be $3,4800, okay? But then it is my job to compare it to the luxury limitations, okay? Well, my luxury limit is $3,160 here, and it's $5,100 here. So on both cases, guys, I'm going to select $3,000 and $4,800, okay? It's less than the limitation, so I can take my makers here. Uh, B, the vehicle now costs $40,000. By the way, I just want to point out, I know the book kind of makes a point of pointing out that cars that are $15,800, like, they seem to imply that that's when you hit this luxury limit. That's not the case. That's if you're on a half-year convention, that's true. But if you're not on a half-year convention, you're on a mid-quarter, the cost of that car can range from less than $15,000 to up to like $63,000 before the limitations will apply. So don't get stuck in your head that a car costs $15,800 and therefore the table applies. That's not true. Okay. And again, our business use percentage is 100, and they want to know year one and year two. Okay, well, here's one, take my asset. Again, your first step, guys, is always going to be to calculate makers. And here it's going to be $8,000. And compare it to your luxury limitation. Well, I can't take my $8,000 makers. I'm stuck with $3,160 here. Okay? Year two, don't even worry about calculating it. Okay? Because again, once you select or you're limited by the table, you're limited by the table in every other year. So 3160 for year two, you're going to have to pick 5100. Okay? You're limited to 5100 of depreciation. Okay? Uh, part C is the same, except for now his business use is 80%. Let's see where we're going with this. So year one, got my $40,000 car. I'm going to go to my table because it's a half year asset. I want to see what my maker's percentage is. Versus my 3160 limit. Okay. Again, I have to pick this. Then multiply it times your business use percentage, the 0.8. So I would be allowed to deduct 25, 28 here. Okay. For year two, again, because I was limited by the table in year one, I'm limited by the table in year two. So I'm going to take my 5100, assuming my business use percentage is again 80%, then I'm going to be able to deduct 40 in year two. Okay. So calculate makers, compare it to the table, select the lesser of the two, then apply your percentage. Do you ever use the ADS as the luxury automobiles? No. Do you what? Do you ever use the ADS for the luxury automobiles? Yeah, if you fall below 50%. Right. I think we're getting there. Oh, okay. um, D. The vehicle cost $40,000 and she used it 80% for business. She sold it on March 1st of year two. Because I'm not worried about that one. Let's skip that one. Um, here, Aiden. The vehicle costs forty thousand dollars, and now she's only going to use it 20 percent for business. Okay, guys. Again, luxury autos are listed property, so the listed property rules apply here. So your business use falls below fifty percent. You have to flip to the AES system. So, part D. Or actually, I don't want to email. now. <laughs> Our car is still worth 40, and the business use is now 20%. So here, we have year one. We have our $40,000 car. We're going to do what? It's a car, so it's five. Okay, so we're going to divide it by five, because now we're on straight line, right? We're on the alternative depreciation system, because we fell below 50%. 
for business use. So we're going to divide it by five because it's a five-year asset. This is year one. Do not forget your convention. Whoever said convention, thank you. Do not forget your convention, okay? Times the business use percentage of 20% uh, gives us $4,000. Sorry, I have to keep erasing, guys. Okay, so this is our, well, this is not, this is our alternative depreciation system versus the luxury limit of 3160. I shouldn't have done that, by the way. I'm going to erase that. You're going to pick the lesser of the two times your 20% business use. So 3160 times 20 is 632. Sorry, we're all crammed in here. Okay? Again, this is listed property. So your business use percentage drops below 50, or 50 or less, I should say. You're on the straight line method. $40,000 car divided by five years because we're on straight line. It's year one of this asset, so it's a convention year. It's a half year, they told us in the beginning, so divide by two to get it down to the convention. It's $4,000. Compare the $4,000 to the limitation table. Pick the lesser of the two, which here is the $3,160, times the business use percentage. Okay? So in year one, we would have $632. Year two, you don't have to calculate, okay? Once we pick from the luxury limitation table, we're gonna do it again. So we would have 5,100 as our starting point times our 20% business usage. And year two would be 1020. Guys, these are like repetitive, but just work through them because you'll get it in like five minutes. Um, last one. The vehicle costs forty thousand dollars and is an SUV that weighed sixty-five hundred pounds. Business use was a hundred percent. Okay, and again, we want to maximize our depreciation. So, what's going to happen here? Forty thousand dollars times sixty-five hundred, but it's greater than sixty. Um, greater than $6,000 is what I should say. Okay, so the luxury <coughs> limits are not applicable, guys. And they tell us the business use is 100%. Okay, the luxury limits are not applicable here. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna start with our $40,000 asset. What can we subtract? We want to maximize our depreciation. We can subtract our $25,000 of $179. Okay, so this is going to leave us with a $15,000 um, balance. Okay, the problem, guys, tells us the fact is, is you could take $8,000 of bonus. The book tells us not to. But if you really wanted to maximize depreciation, you could take $8,000 of bonus. The problem here is telling us not to, which is why we're not doing it. So $15,000, again, we're on makers. Business use percentage is greater than 100%. So if we go to our year one table, it's a 0.2, which is $3,000 of makers, plus the $25,000 of $179. So in total, in year one, they're going to take $28,000 of depreciation. If we were to take a bonus, would you take 8000 or is it up to 8000 So like, because isn't bonus technically half? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we're going to take so seven, 50 or 8, eight You know That's a good question. I don't know if it is a special rule overall for cars. I'd have to look and say. I don't know if the answer is 8000 or 7500 okay. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. It won't give me that long. Uh, I'll look it up in a second. But Aiden's asking, but the general rule says that if you take bonus, it's 50% of the balance after 179, which is $15,000. Technically, our rule says 50% is your bonus calculation, which would be $7,500. But there's special rules in place for the cars that say you can take $8,000 of bonus. So I don't know the answer, if it's $7,500 or $8,000, what he's asking. 
which is probably why they told us uh, not to take bonus in this problem. Um, so I'll have to look it up and say. Um, so anyway, guys, you are on this car. You're just on makers, okay? Luxury limits don't apply. You can take $25,000 at $179, which you really can't do with the regular cars, okay? And then potentially there's the other $8,000 of bonus, okay? All right, guys, that is depreciation. There is a section in here on AMT depreciation. Don't worry about it because um, we're done with AMT, so skip that part. Say that again. It's right, yeah, it's right. Uh, the 15,000? Yeah, and the point two. So this problem deals with a car, okay, that's over 6,000 pounds. And once you go over 6,000 pounds, those luxury limits don't apply anymore. So the rules there say just do your regular maker's depreciation. Now, with those cars, there's another special rule that says they are limited to. $25,000 of 179 depreciation if you elect it. So, and the problem tells us to maximize our depreciation. So we have our $40,000, 6,500 pound car, minus $25,000 of 179 that we're allowed um, is 15,000 balance. Then you calculate your makers. It's a year one. Um, so if you go to the table, it's 0 0.2, uh, which is our $3,000 makers calculation then add back in the 179. So in total, they could take $28,000 of depreciation on a $40,000 car in year one. I just have some more questions to the bonus one. So the 179, would you ever give us the, the taxable income or after 179? Not after 179. I'm not gonna mix this type of problem okay. with so that type of problem. Be it'll be a car question okay. or it'll be a, it will be that it'll be that sort of question. I'm not gonna try and okay. pick you guys up with that. No. Right. no, I will focus on the type of questions that are here. Okay. Okay, okay guys, um, so that's depreciation. Like I said, don't worry about AMT because we've already covered AMT, so don't worry about that section there. Okay guys, the last part here that we're gonna kind of cruise through is amortization. Hey guys, you know that we don't depreciate intangible assets, we amortize them. Um, and the rules for amortization, guys, are fairly straightforward, okay? You always, always, always use straight lines for tax purposes with amortization. And instead of all these conventions, you know, half year, half month, etc., you start with the first of the month, okay? It's always a full month. Okay. Um, the book breaks it out into four different types of intangibles. Um, the first section is 197 intangibles. Okay, guys, these apply to intangibles when you purchase them as part of a overall purchase, okay? Um, typically, you're gonna go in maybe and buy another business, and you're not just buying their intangibles, but you're buying many assets. And the idea is that you pay a price and then you add up the fair market value of all the assets you're purchasing, and then you divvy up the purchase price to each asset. Um, so maybe I go in and I buy a bar, okay? And I buy all the TVs, and I buy all the sports memorabilia, and I buy the tables, and the shot glasses, and I buy their liquor license, okay? So I take my purchase price and I allocate it out to each asset, okay? For the tables and chairs, and the glasses, and the TVs, I'm gonna use my maker's depreciation. But for that liquor license, my intangible, because I purchased this as part of an overall purchase with numerous assets, okay, it's covered by section 197. And it says that you depreciate that intangible over 180 months, despite what the actual remaining useful life is on the asset. So I might have just purchased that liquor license, and it might only have seven years left on it before it expires doesn't matter. I'm still going to depreciate it over 180 months, even though technically it only has seven years left that it's good for. Okay? 180 months, by the way, guys, is 15 years. So, okay. So when you purchase an intangible as part of a group of assets, you're going to depreciate it over 180 months, starting in the month of purchase. Okay? So if I purchase these things on July 15th, I start depreciating them on July 1st. Okay, the book then covers um, research and experimentation costs, guys. I mean, I would think about it this way. Sorry. Um, so it's a 
always 15 years, no matter if it's less or more. Yes, it's always 15 years, 180 months, as long as it's part of this group yeah. purchase. Yes, 180 is your rule. We're gonna change it a little bit in a minute, so. Um, so research and experiment costs, guys. Think of drug companies, okay? They invest hundreds of million dollars in new drugs, okay? Um, they don't know whether or not these drugs are gonna come to fruition, but they're spending all this money, okay? They get a little bit of leeway under the tax code here, okay? They say that, look, you can immediately expense these costs, so as you're incurring them, you can expense them. Some companies may choose to do that, but I will tell you, and generally I tell you guys, look, we do wanna pull forward our expenses, but sometimes companies may not wanna do that, especially when you have a drug that you're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in because you may be showing losses for years before you actually reap a benefit. So instead of immediately expensing what a lot of them will choose to do in this case, and it's okay under the tax code, they say that you can capitalize them and amortize them over the determinable life of the asset, which is gonna be unusual because you don't always know the determinable life of the asset. Or what most of them will do is they say you can capitalize it and then you could start to depreciate or amortize it, sorry, um, over a period of not less than 60 months, okay? So no less than five years. Could be longer, but no less than 60 months, which is what most companies are gonna opt for because ideally they've spent this money, finally the drug will hopefully hit the market, they'll start getting the benefit of the sales, and then they'll start expecting the drug once these sales start taking place. So they have a bit of a matching with the expenses and the revenue so that their balance sheet or their p ls don't look so hard at all. Um, okay. Can you say that a little bit the 60 month one? They can immediately expense it as they occur it. They can capitalize it and um, amortize it over the determinable useful life of whatever it is they have created. I'm just using the example of a drug company or they can capitalize it and start to amortize it when they reap the benefit of, let's say, the sale um, over a period of not less than 60 months. So no less than five years if you choose to capitalize it. Um, okay, now the book, and the book gets into an example of this. Um, what may happen, guys, is that you may create this drug, spend years developing it, okay? You're gonna capitalize the costs, and then hopefully you get the drug out onto the market, um, and you start selling it. And in the meantime, you might have applied for a patent, but patents take a long time to come through. So you may start selling this drug before you have the patent. And once you start selling the drug is once you have to start amortizing it, because the rules say you start amortizing when you receive the benefit of your work. Um, so now you may start amortizing it, and then a year, two years, three years, what have you, the patent may finally come through. And the rules say that you stop the amortization at this point. Okay? Whatever's sitting unamortized in the account you had been amortizing up till now, the research and experiment costs, you take those unamortized costs, you combine them with any patent expenses. You might pay attorneys, you may pay patent fees. Okay? You take the unamortized costs, plus these patent fees, you put them in a new account, and then you amortize them together over the life of the patent, okay? And you'll be told what the life of the patent is. So if you were, if you did capitalize your r &E expenses and you had started to amortize them over this period of not less than 60 years, okay? And at some later date now, you get a patent, you stop that amortization, whatever happened, happens, it's done, but you take whatever's sitting in that account unamortized, you add it together with any patent expenses that you've incurred, put that in a new account, and then this new amount gets amortized over the life of the patent, okay? Um, hold on to that for a minute. Uh, now, going back to um, patents and copyrights, okay? So we talked about 197. You might purchase these patents and copyrights as part of a group of assets. And if you do that again, 197 applies and the period of amortization is 180 months regardless of the actual useful life of the assets, okay? If you only purchase the patent or you only purchase the copyright, you're not purchasing a bunch of assets all at once. You're specifically buying the patent or you're specifically buying the copyright from another party, okay? In that case, the rules say that you amortize over the remaining 
useful life of the patent or of the copyright. So if I didn't buy the whole bar and the shot glasses and the tables and the TVs and the liquor license, but I just went in and said, I just want your liquor license, and it only had seven years left on it, I would amortize my cost of that liquor license over seven years, okay? So if it's part of a group of assets, it's 180 months. If it's, you know, just I cherry picked the intangible, the patent or the copyright, how much life is left on it? Okay. The last part here, guys, says um, if you self-create, okay, you self-create a patent, you self-create a copyright, then you amortize over its legal life. Okay, and again, you'll be given that. So there's potentially three different rules for copyrights and patents. Um, I, would, I would tell you the remaining useful life. I would tell you is legal life. I would guess. Okay. So just know that for, particularly for patents and copyrights, there's potentially three different rules out there, depending on how you purchase it or did you create it. Okay. Um, the last, and there's a good problem I will recommend to you. It's problem number 72. And this deals with the whole um, research experimentation cost. So what happens if you start to sell the drug before you get the patent and then at a later date you get the patent? That deals with this particularly. So take a look at that. It's the problem number 72. Okay, I'm gonna try and get to this last part quickly here. The last group of amortization costs, guys, are what are called organization startup expenditures, okay? These are actually two different provisions, okay? You are starting a new business, depending on the type of business you're starting, you may have organizational expenses and you may have startup expenses. Organizational expenses apply to new corporations, new partnerships only. They do not apply to sole proprietorships, LLCs, like that, okay? Startup expenses apply to any form of business, okay? You may have both of these. Um, now, in the case of organizational expenditures, okay, these actually relate to forming a new, uh, again, corporation or a new partnership. So it may include, if it's a corporation, state registration fees, okay? You have to pay the state the form. Um, you may have cost for temporary directors. You're gonna have various organizational meetings, so any costs incurred in holding these organizational meetings before the business begins. Uh, any legal fees, okay? So you're gonna pay the attorneys, they're gonna draft your bylaws, your corporate charter, articles of incorporation. You may uh, pay the attorneys to draft the terms of stock certificates, okay? So anything related to forming this corporation or partnership, okay, that happens generally, guys, before the start of operation are gonna be your organizational expenses. What are not counted as organizational expenses are what are called syndication costs, okay? These are costs related to selling and issuing stock. Selling and issuing stock. Um, so literally, you could be printing the stock. That is not an organizational cost. Any cost to underwriters, any commissions for selling these pieces of stock, okay? These are syndication costs. They are not organization costs. They're gonna go, they're gonna get capitalized and sit on your balance sheet until you file your last tax return. They may sit out there for years and years and years on your balance sheet, but they're not gonna get expensed. Um, so let me see, just cost related to issuing, selling, um, underwriter broker fees are not, are gonna be syndication costs, printing costs, promotional materials, any sort of prospectus for the sale of the stock, and any costs related to acquiring or transferring assets between shareholders and the partnership or the corporation. Okay, those are syndication. Startup costs are a little bit different, okay? Startup costs, guys, the terms say that these are any costs but incurred for not only investigating the possibility of starting a business. So you may say, oh, I want to develop this new product. Is there a need out there? You may do some market research or some product research. That would be a startup cost. You may do um, scouting for a good location. Where should I put my business? Okay, that would be a startup cost. Now, in addition to these types of costs, it also going to include, before you open your doors for business, you're going to need to hire some staff. You're going to Pay them. So salaries before you open the doors for business. Okay, things like rent before you open the doors for business. Um, 
training, right? Um, you may have to get computers, you may be leasing computers. Anything that would be a normal business expense once operations were up and running will generally be a startup expense, okay, before the doors open. Um, okay, now here's the way it works. So guys, that's one part of the problem, is figuring out what is an organizational cost, what is not, what is a startup cost, what is not, okay? The next part of the problem says that if you incur these types of expenses, the code initially says you can deduct $5,000 worth of these costs immediately. Okay, you can deduct $5,000 worth of these costs immediately. But then they do what they always do. But if you have too many of these costs, we're gonna start to take away that immediate expense. Okay? So they say for each dollar you go over $50,000, they reduce that five thousand they initially offer you by one dollar. Okay, so initially they offer you five thousand dollars, but then they say if you incur organizational expenses of more than fifty thousand dollars for each dollar you go over fifty, we're going to make a dollar for dollar reduction of the initial five we offered you. So by the time you reach fifty-five thousand dollars for organizational expenses, you're no longer going to get that five thousand dollar immediate expense. Okay. Any of these costs that don't qualify for immediate expensing, guys, they get capitalized and amortized over 180 months. And you start the amortization when you kick off the business operations. All right, we'll go through this one problem quickly. I'm gonna tell you guys to look at problem number 71 on your own, and I have two minutes use them, sorry. Um, look at problem number 70 quickly. Um, we have Juliet informed a new business to sell sporting goods. Uh, the business opened its doors to customers on June 1st. To determine the amount of startup costs Juliet can immediately expense um, this year in the following situations. So right now we're concerned with immediate expensing. Um, she incurred startup costs of $2,000. How much can she immediately expense? She incurred oh, two thousand. Yeah, they're not going to give you five. <laughs> um, she incurred startup costs of forty-five thousand. Uh, right. Okay, guys. As long as you don't hit fifty thousand dollars, you can take that five thousand dollars of immediate expenses. Fifty-three five hundred. Yeah, you're going to get 1500 You went over the 50000 mark by 3500 so you're going to take your 5000 minus the 3500 you went over by. That leaves you with $1,500 of immediate expensing. Um, all right, so you guys get the message. Look at problem 70, look at problem 71, and I'll decide if we need to cover this quick when we come back. Um, have a great weekend, guys. Practice exercises are open for nine and